What a wonderful opportunity to be in a room like this, filled with men and women who care as deeply as each of you do about our country. Thank you for what each of you does in your own way to protect our freedoms. It's my great privilege and honor tonight to talk about an incredible American, Annette Conway. <laughs> because the truth is, as Jim will be the first one to say, uh, that his award is in fact a family award, and much bigger than his own nuclear family. But the fact is that Annette has been an incredible partner for him. They were married on 14 June 1969, and before the rude people in the room started doing math, remember, it was Arkansas, and they can marry at 13. <laughs> but Annette has been Jim's partner for his entire time as a United States Marine, and like all military families, she and her children, their children, deserve special recognition on nights like tonight. Because <laughs> the truth is that our spouses support us in incredible ways. And when we're training, they're there. And when we get tired, they dust us off and put us back in. And when we deploy, they stay home and keep the kids safe and take care of all the family things without dad or without mom. And they pray that we come home safe. And when we do come home safe and get awards for whatever it is we did, they stand in the background and pretend they had nothing to do with it. Whereas in fact, they had everything to do with it. Our spouses and military families serve the nation as well as anybody who's ever worn the cloth. And this family, this Conway family, is exceptional, not only in Jim's chosen bride, but their children. Brandon, Major, United States Marine Corps. Son Scott, Major, United States Marine Corps. Daughter Samantha, who has been part of the Marine family her entire life and is now married to Major David Moore, United States Marine Corps. <laughs> I think you get the point, which is that this incredible Marine, who is my privilege to talk about tonight, has an incredible family, and they are not unique. They are very much representative of the families that, that serve this nation. But Jim Conway is a Marine's Marine. Jim Conway is first and foremost a warrior. During Desert Shield, Desert Storm, he was a battalion commander. In the workup to the attack into Iraq, Jim was a two-star division commander. And just before March of 2003, our good friend Jim Jones left being Commandant of the Marine Corps after having been selected to be Supreme Allied Commander of Europe. And Jim was replaced as Commandant by General Mike Hagee, who was Jim Conway's boss out in California. And Jim Conway, about two months before major combat in Iraq, steps up from being division commander to being the Marine Expeditionary Force commander. And he and his Army count counterparts attacked 
into Baghdad, he in charge of 90,000 plus U.S. and United Kingdom forces inside of three weeks under his leadership and, as he would point out, so many other incredible leaders quickly taking Baghdad. Were there problems after that? You bet. If you want to talk to who has the problems, come talk to me. Jim Conway and his Marines were superb in their execution. Jim is a man of great courage. I have come to admire physical courage in combat, as you would expect I would. But I've also come to admire those who have intellectual courage, especially in this town. Those, those who are sitting in rooms full of very powerful people, where the discussion is going in one direction, and those who have the temerity to say, I see it differently, and here's why. Jim Conway. Jim Conway is known for his candor. If you don't want to know the answer, don't ask him. If you don't want his opinion, do not invite him to the meeting, because you're going to get what you're going to get, which is going to be very thoughtful, very articulate, with feeling, but as dispassionately as possible, putting his ideas on the table in a way that serves all of us well. You don't have to be right all the time, but you do have to do what Jim does, which is speak your mind in a professional, straightforward way that adds to the dialogue, and Jim does that. Jim's a man of great compassion. He started, stood up, the Marines Wounded Warrior Regiment, specifically, specifically to take care of our Marines who are wounded in combat, not only while they're on active duty, but importantly, to make sure that for the rest of their lives, they have a place to turn to when they need help and someone who's going to be looking out after them, checking in on them to make sure that they're okay and that their service to this country is recognized and valued for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Along with his lifetime partner, Annette, the two of them have done incredible things to support our families. Annette especially has done miraculous things to devise and develop programs to support our families. And go figure, Jim listened and helped implement and made the resources available to do the things that the two of them decided were the right, right things to do. And compassion goes not only to those two things, but also to things like the mine-resistant armor-protected vehicles, MRAPs. Jim Conway was commandant about one month. I was chairman. Jim goes overseas for his first tour as commandant. He comes back and he delivers, hand delivers to my office, a letter from the commandant of the Marine Corps to the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in which he says, there are vehicles in production right now called MRAPs, and they help protect our troops from IEDs. And he says very clearly in the, in, the, in the letter, precisely, it is a moral obligation for us to provide these vehicles, this protection to our troops. I get this letter from the Commandant of the Marine Corps, who has had his job less than a month. We take it directly that week into the tank, where we talk about it with the Joint Chiefs. We go to Secretary Rumsfeld, who goes to the President, and with Congress's support, we end up with 17,000 of these vehicles, 
which were started because a man of compassion looking at his troops who, yes, is going to defeat the enemy, but wants to do it in a way that takes care of his troops. Thanks, Jim. Jim is a man of great humility. I don't know that I've heard him say, I, other than when he absolutely positively had to. It's always about we. It's always about his Corps of Marines and all of the joint forces. It also manifests itself in the way he does his job. You know, Marines always think of themselves and want to be, be thought of as great war fighters. Well, you know, he is one. But the truth of the matter is that there have been times when he was put into jobs that he didn't want. I was the uh, J3, Director for Operations on the Joint Staff as a three-star, and Jim was a brand new one-star. And he came to the Joint Staff for a job that was going to be in the National Military Command Center. And that job was going to be 14 months, 14 months, and he was going to get a get-out-of-jail-free card and get out of D.C. and go back to, to the troops he wanted to be with. About two months into that assignment, General Shalikashvili was a chairman. And General Shalikashvili came to me and said, I need you to pick your finest flag officer because I want to start up a new organization that's going to help me combat terrorism. This is 1996. I went to Jim and said, Jim, I'd like you to do this. But don't worry, it's still going to be 14 months. Jim took on the job, strapped it on, did a superb job. I left six months later. He stayed two years. <laughs> not a peep, not a complaint, just whatever we needed him to do, he was going to do. Yes, he wanted to command troops in combat, and yes, he did. But whatever it was we asked him to do, his humility, his humanity, his understanding of the needs of the service led him to do it incredibly well. He is a leader in every respect. He is smart. He studies. He studies his chosen career path. And he makes sure that those around him study as well. Look at him. He's physically fit. You know, in the Pentagon, I know two things about going to the gym. One is, if you want to use the weights, you got to get there before General Conway, because if you don't, he's got them all. <laughs> and the other is, do not be the guy or gal who makes it, who gets in the way of General Conway actually getting to the gym that day. That's not a good place to be. The last thing I will say about Jim is that he has never forgotten the three words that he learned as a second lieutenant in 1970 at the base of school 30 miles south of where we're sitting. And those three words are, officers eat last. Now, when you think about that, you say, what? When you first start learning this, this and this is very fundamental to, to your Marine Corps, yes, it's about initially when food gets delivered to the field, the troops eat first. And if there's not enough food left for the officers, the officers should have, better, should have done a better job of ordering the food. <laughs> but it goes into absolutely everything. It goes to absolutely every thread. It's the belief that leading our enlisted troops is a sacred obligation. That without enlisted troops, officers serve no purpose. And Jim Conway knows that. Jim Conway lives that. Jim Conway's Marines know he knows it. They know he lives it. And it is why Pete Pace is so honored to introduce to you the 2010 Keeper of the Flame Award recipient and 
your 34th Commandant of the United States Marine Corps, General James T. Conway. Thank you, sir. That was powerful. Wow. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice job.